I am visiting assistant professor at Oglethorpe University. Um, and it is my pleasure to be chairing session two, where we will have Pinar Durgan and Claudia Glatz uh, talking to us. Uh, first up, we have Pinar Durgan uh, of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And she will be giving a talk titled, Beyond the Veil of the Great Sin, Local Anatolian Origins of Hittite Mortuary Practices. So, Pinar. You're tall, so tall, Jess, I have to fix this. Okay, hello everyone. Um, before I start, I would like to thank the organizing committee for putting together all these interesting talks, uh, but also in a different capacity as the founder of Project Visiting Scholar for all their hard work and efforts um, to making this conference more inclusive and accessible. You will see signs all over this um, conference room. Um, and if you're interested in hearing about um, how to make your own conferences more inclusive and accessible, talk to them. Um, they have done it. They're the first conference to actually complete the checklist, as I said, so I'm very proud of them. Um, okay, so let's get started on this. So to give a little bit of background to this research, um, in my dissertation, I looked at Anatolian cemeteries and mortuary practices throughout the Bronze Age with a more diachronic approach. So I guess this research kind of falls into that division that we just discussed about political versus social history. So maybe this can kind of go into that category of social histories. Um, the, the study that I did was, was about both prehistoric but also Hittite period mortuary practices. I used both archaeological and textual evidence, so most of the texts that I looked at, as you can imagine, was from the Hittite period, um, to understand change and continuity in mortuary traditions of Anatolian communities. And during the course of this research, one of the biggest obstacles was what I called the divides between how cemeteries and settlements, how Hittite and pre-Hittite, and how textual and archaeological evidence was studied. So in my paper today, I will focus on what I call the divide um, in the study of the Hittite empire um, and what came before it. In the second part of my talk, I will exemplify how kind of mending this divide um, can tell us more about long-term local traditions and local practices. And I specifically picked this cheesy image um, as it represents the idea of being at the margins of life and death, but also um, between what is Anatolian and what is Hittite. So in this paper, by analyzing Hittite period royal funerary texts called Shalish Vashtaish, translated into Great Sin, I discuss the treatment of dead bodies, the use of burial objects, and the placement of cemeteries in the second millennium, both in the Hittite core land, but also in Western Anatolia. And I compare these to the third millennium mortuary practices um, to trace elements that were kept and abandoned throughout time. I think this approach enables us to see what kind of ideological, symbolic, um, and also social needs these cemeteries fulfilled. And I argue that it also helps us break these traditional unilinear um, narratives about Anatolia's social history, um, cultural identities, and local traditions. So to start with um, the divides, of course, we talked a little bit about you know, the national divides, the national borders that kind of uh, limit the study of the areas that we study. There's also this disciplinary divide um, between Anatolian archaeology, Near Eastern archaeology, and classical archaeology. So the peninsula is basically um, usually divided by uh, these disciplinary boundaries or borders, what I call. You can see that there are little um, pockets of ancient Near Eastern archaeology kind of coming into Anatolia. So these are very famous sites that get mentioned in the study of um, the wider engineers in archaeology and history, uh, such as Çatalhöyük, Hattusha, or um, Kültepe Karımkanesh. There is, of course, also a chronological divide, uh, which is a big problem in the study of mortuary practices, because mortuary practices are conservative. They do not really change quickly. And cemeteries, in particular, do not really follow our periodization based on pottery sequences, um, settlement patterns, or historical events. And so far, the mortuary practices of Anatolia have been always studies within, studied within the um, chronological boundaries. So we have early Bronze Age mortuary practices kind of studied only within the context of the third millennium. Um, same also goes for, uh, for prehistoric uh, mortuary practices. You will probably can you know, recall some of the things from Çatalhöyük, for instance. Um, but what I'm trying to do here is to apply a more diachronic approach. 
Um, and I, I think that this will help us understand what changes and what continues um, later on into the Hittite Empire. Another divide we have um, is based on the research questions that we have in these different chronological periods. So when we study, for instance, late Calcolithic or early Bronze Age, um, one of the main questions is this question of urbanization, settlement plans, or the emergence of social stratification, so the emergence of elites, uh, which is still a question that kind of dominates the study of the early Bronze Age. Then we have the Middle Bronze Age, uh, which is kind of centered around um, this one very famous site, Karim Kanesh. And then Hittitology is kind of more focused on um, Hattusha, the Hittite Empire, um, and the Hittite um, textual sources. And of course, there are projects um, that kind of transgress these um, chronological but also disciplinary divide. So we're going to hear about uh, Kunakuk, for instance, or Jide archaeological projects. Uh, but traditionally, this has been the general way of studying the Anatolian past. Oop. Hmm. OK, there was another line between um, text and archaeological evidence. There it is. Um, which is the, the traditional way of studying Anatolian past. And if you ever go into one of these more, um, what's the right word, traditional departments um, in Turkey, you will see that, for instance, protohistoric and prehistoric archaeology is a separate de department than Hittitology or um, other ancient Near Eastern languages. So there is definitely this kind of um, disciplinary boundary between these different research questions. And there is, of course, uh, what I call the cultural historical baggage um, that we have in the early writings or the early studies of Anatolian past. So we usually talk about Anatolian past in this very evolutionary, unilinear, upward going um, pattern. So we have villages. From villages, we go to chiefdoms, from chiefdoms to colonies. And then the peak of civilization is kind of considered the Hittite Empire. And of course, these cultural historical narratives have their roots in nationalism and nation-building agendas, which was a conscious effort by the newly established um, Turkish Republic, especially by the founder of the Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, um, who had a special interest in the Hittite past. Here's a little uh, logo of the Anatolian Civilizations Museum, uh, which was also established as um, kind of in line with these agendas. The first Turkish excavations also started together kind of in this um, what is right nationalist agenda. So we have Alajahuk, uh, which is one of the earliest Turkish excavations that took place in Turkey by Turkish scholars. Um, and again, the site is very famous for its early Bronze Age, but also Hittite levels. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Alajahuk and how it's um, part of these, these more modern identities, but also how it frames the way that we look at the Anatolian identity. So at Olajahuk, which is this early Bronze Age site, we have these 13 so-called royal graves that benchmark Anatolian archaeology, um, and at the same time is a political kind of keystone uh, for the young, thriving Turkish Republic in the 30s, um, which was looking for this kind of Anatolian-based identity. We're going to come back to Alajahuk in a little bit. So let's move on to mortuary practices, kind of uh, moving on from Alajahuk into what is the, the Anatolian way of burying people. So I'm going to start with the location of cemeteries. So usually um, in mortuary archaeology, we kind of ignore this aspect of cemeteries, the relationship with the, between the cemetery and the landscape. Um, so I'm going to start with that. And just to orient ourselves, I don't know if you can see my my arrow, can you see it? OK, great. So here is, for those of you who don't know, it's here's Hattusha, um, and here's Alajahuk. I'm not going to talk that much about Kültepe Karum Kanesh, but if you're interested in the mortuary practices there, there's a great dissertation by BK Yazıcıoğlu, so I'll refer you to that one. Um, so Anatolian communities started to bury their death um, starting at the end of the late Calcolithic period. Um, so extramural cemeteries emerged around this time. Uh, they became more, more widespread in the early Bronze Age, so I shorten it as EBA. So here you're looking at the, the map of, of modern Turkey marked with all these sites that have burial data or, or cemeteries. <clears throat> 
And before this period, most of the people uh, would be buried either underneath houses or in public structures, but always within the settlement. Many of these cemeteries consist of a large number of people, so some of these cemeteries can actually go up to 500 burials, um, but this is really not representative of the whole population. There are lots of cemeteries that we haven't found, um, probably somewhere in the landscape waiting uh, for their discoveries. But from the ones that we know, and the ones that are excavated, we know that there are three major types of burials in Anatolia during this time period. So we have pitos burials, which are these large um, storage vessels, both used in the settlement for storage purposes, but then also in the cemeteries for burying dead people. Um, sometimes they're just one person kind of laid into the pitos, but in some cases we also have multiple individuals kind of pushed inside the, the pitos jar. Then we have cis burials, these stone-lined rectangular structures, um, and then we have just normal, simple inhumations. And if you look at the map, actually, in terms of numbers, the most common type of burial in Anatolia is the pitos burials. So one of my research questions was, once cemeteries move from inside the settlements to outside of the settlements, is there any kind of pattern that we can trace to see where they're actually located in relation to their settlements? And I, I made this um, small illustration. You can see these are the sites that actually have an excavated settlement and a cemetery that are more or less contemporary. And there is really no pattern in where the settlement and cemetery is located in the landscape in relation to each other. There is more or less a west, um, east-west kind of direction for the bodies or the pitos jars, but not really um, anything that gives any useful information about where the cemetery is located. So instead of direction, I changed my focus into where these cemeteries are in the landscape. So I looked at landscape features around these cemeteries and actually realized that a lot of these cemeteries were located in the landscape that are marked somehow by natural features. So here we have an example um, of an early Bronze Age cemetery in kind of um, central western Anatolia called Yortan. And you can see the tiny little black pitos burials which are surrounded by these um, yellow blobs that represent these um, volcanic rocky outcrops. Another example comes, comes from the second millennium, um, uh, from a site called Osman Kayası, which is actually uh, in between Hatusha and Yazılıkaya. So it's on this um, kind of ritual route leading to Yazılıkaya. And this is again a rocky outcrop, um, kind of in the middle of the landscape, and it has this cave-like structure, so it has a niche inside of it, where all the urns, um, we're gonna talk about urns in a little bit, um, cremated and uncremated bodies were placed. Another good example is Yanarlar. So Yanarlar is right here. This is where Yortan is, and this is where Osman Kayas is located. So in this, in this cemetery, we actually don't have the cemetery itself marked by the landscape, but the cemetery is clearly oriented towards um, these volcanic formations that you can see in the background. They kind of look like the Cappadocian fairy chimneys. So you can see the pitos burials are all kind of turned toward um, this natural landmark. And even though we don't really have what we call a royal Hittite burial, we, saw, we have these um, texts that I mentioned before, these Shalish Vashtaish texts, which explain the royal funerary ceremonies. So these ceremonies took about 14 days, um, and they kind of lay out the progress or the process of burying the dead queen or the king. So in one of these excerpts, actually on day three, they talk about bringing the, the um, cremated remains, the, the body basically, to what is called a stone house. And some people have argued that this, the stone house must have been at or near the Hittite capital. Again, we don't know exactly which this, what the stone house would have looked like or where it would be located, but some have suggested that maybe Yazlikaya could be some sort of mortuary monument or a mausoleum or a royal funerary monument. Similarly, Nishantash could be marking um, the cult of the dead king. Another possibility that was suggested was uh, Gavur Kaleste at Haimana, which is again this kind of mountaintop monument. It's a small, small hike actually during my time at Bilkent, we had a little trip there. So you cl climb up this rocky outcrop um, and there's this relief, this hit, clearly Hittite relief. And then if you go around, there's actually a structure, um, again, made out of stone 
Um, this structure was, you know, looted in, in the past, so we don't really have any kind of material evidence. But again, the fact that it's located at this landscape monument makes it kind of similar to the examples that we've seen before. And again, we don't have any royal Hittite burial, which makes a lot of people very sad, especially people who study mortuary practices like me. Um, but we actually do have some, some burials from Hattusha, especially the earlier levels, which would be um, intramural burials. But no one has really um, discussed these as, as Hittite burials, per se. And due to the texts that we have, these, these royal funerary texts that kind of lay out the, the funerary procession or progression, um, we know that the bodies must have been cremated. So cremation has been a big um, question in the study of, of mortuary practices, not only in Anatolia, but also in the rest of the Mediterranean. Um, and as you can see from this excerpt, it's clearly they're talking about a pyre, they're talking about ex extinguishing the fire and then picking up bones. So there's no question that there is some sort of cremation activity going on. And a lot of scholars actually have noticed the similarities between these texts and also some uh, classical texts. For instance, Hector's funeral has some sort of similar um, ritual aspects to it. Um, and what we know from archaeological evidence is that cremation actually didn't start on mainland Greece up until um, late Helladic III, which is about 12th century. So these texts come from the second millennium, and actually if we look at archaeological evidence from Anatolia itself, we see that cremation starts around third millennium BC. There are some Neolithic burials um, that have shown evidence for being exposed to fire. But these are not full cremation, so a lot of people don't really consider them in this category of cremated bodies. But we know for sure that starting with third millennium, which is the time period that we start seeing these extramural cemeteries, we do have evidence for cremation. And what I'm highlighting here on this table is that cremation doesn't really come in and replace already existing burial traditions. It just goes um, alongside of these traditional um, types of burials that we've seen before. So every cemetery that has cremation also has um, inhumation burials. So it's not as it was assumed at some point a new um, tradition that is brought in by the Hittites. At Osman Kays, for instance, the cemetery that we just looked at, we have cremation urns placed right next to simple inhumations. In other places, for instance, at Arabash, which is the cemetery of Ajemhuk, some of you may know, in central Anatolia, we have pitos burials next to urns, and then we also have simple inhumations. Um, and all of these burials are more or less contemporary, so there's no separation of different types of burials at any point. More interestingly, so this example comes from Middle Bronze Age, Demir Jehuk. Um, there is this one pithos that actually has both burned and unburned human remains mixed in the same pithos. So again, there's no separation of this concept of cremation being something different or new. And if we compare what we've seen in these more traditional Anatolian uh, mortuary practices, there is not really that much in common with what we see at Alajahuk, for instance. So at Alajahuk, we have these um, burial structures almost that are lined with stones and then wooden beams. Um, sometimes there's lines of uh, sacrificed animals on top, um, different kinds of objects that we know only from a couple more sites from central Anatolia, and there's no trace of cremation. So even though Alajahuk has been so um, important in the establishment of the Turkish identity, I feel like this has also kind of skewed our expectations of how a Hittite burial would have looked like. So I think instead of looking at that as, as the kind of key site for mortuary practices of Anatolia, uh, we should maybe consider what the evidence actually suggests. It's probably a little bit less elaborate, less elite looking, but more something like, like Osman Kayesa, for instance. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the rituals themselves that are mentioned in these texts. So especially, so I put up this picture, which is, um, a reconstruction of an Iron Age funerary feast. Uh, we don't have any kind of representation of, of funerary feasts from the Hittite period, so we'll go with this one. Uh, for the early Bronze Age, actually, with the emergence of extramural cemeteries, we also see a lot of new 
types of drinking and eating vessels. So here's a little example from Bakatepe, which is in Western Anatolia, and you can see that most of the shapes actually are for drinking, serving, or maybe even perhaps for libation offerings and similar sort of activities. Um, during this time period, we have a new form, which is the depas. It's, it's kind of in the background on that red picture, uh, which is this large drinking vessels with, with these huge handles um, on either side. They're more common in Western Anatolia, not so common in, in Central Anatolia, but we still do see examples of those. On the other hand, in Central Anatolia, we see um, these smaller metal vessels, and we actually have evidence of those in burials themselves. So the picture that you're looking at is actually this, this person uh, who was buried with the little um, metal vessel on his pinky finger. Another important aspect of these rituals is sacrifices, so animal sacrifices. Um, either sacrifice as, as some sort of food for the dead or um, sacrifices left for, at the burials, but also there's evidence for butchered and burned animal remains. So it's, it has been suggested that there was some sort of feeding, feasting activity going on for the living visiting these cemeteries as well. Mostly we have cattle remains, but also some equids. Um, for instance, here we have one skull from the Osman Kayasa cemetery. And we see the mention of these animal sacrifices and feasts um, throughout these Shalish Vashtaish texts. For instance, we have this little excerpt from the first day where they dedicate um, one plow of ox. Um, throughout these rituals, they talk about feeding the deceased, feeding the performers, feeding the people who um, um, participate in these funerary rituals. And then there's also this mention of libation. So they bring a jug of wine and libate it to the soul, and then they break it. And this idea of breaking objects in the mortuary context is actually a very old tradition that has existed in Anatolia starting in the, um, the third millennium. So here we have some examples, for instance, from Gordion, from Gordion's um, Hittite period cemetery, where we have all these jugs and jars with their, with their necks and mouths uh, kind of broken. And if that's not convincing enough for you, because they're ceramics, they break, right? Uh, we have other evidence, for instance, these metal vessels that I just mentioned um, that have been found kind of uh, bent or, or kind of smashed as well. So there's this idea of maybe some people call them killing of the objects, so some sort of destruction or breaking ceremony. Another important aspect of um, the funerary rituals in the third millennium are music. So these are some objects. So the ones on the left side and in the middle do not really have a context. They're from museums. Uh, but the one that you, you see on your right is actually from a burial found at Horos Tepe, um, dating to the early Bronze Age. And again, because we don't have any depictions of mortuary funeraries from the Hittite Empire, I put this, um, the Inandik vase, but I also put it next to the text that we have from the Hittites, where they mention singers playing instruments. There's also a mention of performers saying things or kind of yelling things. There's also mourning ladies, uh, which we know from other cultures as well. But just to show you how important these performers or musicians are in the context of any kind of ritual, you can see that they're, they're constantly shown, especially on this ritual um, vase, the Inandak vase. So to bring this all together, I suggest that looking at archaeological evidence helps us see beyond the veil of the Shalish Vashtaish texts. And almost all the elements that were part of these texts are actually found archaeologically, both in the third and in the second millennium cemeteries. And the fact that the materials and objects didn't really change, even though maybe their meanings have changed or the way that they've been used may have changed. We see a lot of similarities in the way that um, local Anatolian traditions um, have been practiced at these cemeteries, but also how they're mentioned in the, in the Hittite um, royal funeraries. And I think this shows us that studying Hittite, what we call Hittite burial traditions, within itself and not really comparing it to what comes before or what comes after can create these false expectations or even misinterpretation of the evidence, such as, you know, as we've seen with cremation, kind of thinking that that's a new thing that comes into Anatolia.
So I think, uh, to conclude, I, I, I should argue that mending the divide starts with understanding the disciplinary and historical baggages, as well as evidence and methodologies we use as archaeologists or linguists. And especially if our goal is to understand local traditions and their def effects on imperial cultures, or vice versa, um, we cannot really limit ourselves um, to, to chronological or even um, disciplinary borders. And I think that's why we're all here. So I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. And we have time for discussion. Any questions? And I will ask if you both could repeat the questions for the live stream so that we can, everybody can hear the questions before they're answered. To repeat the question, um, it is about if there's any kind of religious idea that is connected to these landscape features like rocky outcrops or kind of mountainous areas. Um, so the like the landscape features like mountain tops or these like you know spring features, uh, things like that are very important in Hittite religion. So there are specific gods associated with them. But as far as I know, there's really no like mortuary god. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that is associated with any kind of like landscape monument. There are a couple of texts from Hattusha that talk about kind of the afterlife, which are very similar to the Mesopotamian idea of this kind of dark place in a way um, but as far as like the specificity of the landscape I don't I'm not aware of any kind of like God um, do you know any um, yes but not with rock outcome right. Right. Certain springs stunning cities were by springs or riverbanks right. and that we see a lot yeah but not necessarily with rock outcomes uh, obviously there was this idea in the karstic landscape and Springs <coughs> like to the underworld, so you found these goddesses or other sonic deities there, and whenever they wanted to address anybody in the underworld, that that's where they would go. Um, so that's yeah. In Hatsusha, there's this little uh, kind of niche that is supposed to be maybe one of those like gates to the underworld, uh, but it's it's a you know a human built structure. It's not really like a natural like rocky you know land, landscape feature. Uh, but that's a really good question. Thank you. Yeah, um, I have a question for Claudia about um, your very interesting talk and you're walking us through the evidence of, uh, in terms of what you found. Um, what I'm interested in is, in part, what you alluded to, but didn't really, you're not able to talk about this at this point, um, and that's this question of being able to track the people and the animals, you mentioned a few times, having some possible ways of doing that. And I'm curious just to hear more about what that would entail, but also what that would, what you hope that would contribute to what you laid out specifically. So I have in mind that the, um, you laid out these shared practices, which are pretty well pointed to. The, the artifacts are a good index of, uh, 
the practices. But then I'm, I'm, I'm curious about whether you want to go from these shared practices to seeing them as proxies for other forms of identity. Um, and so how that, so both using what you've looked at and, and analyzed and put together in terms of this argument, and then also how you might see the people moving, uh, and, and how, and whether those, whether you're interested in, in seeing uh, expressions of, of identity high and low or you're more interested in the hybrid or mixture or sort of holding off from uh, over-attaching yourself to these objects as proxies. Yeah. So that's, that's enough to, to repeat. <laughs> yes, I'm going to try. So correct me if I, I've misunderstood something. Um, the first question was about how can we track or reconstruct movement of people and animals, and then how the um, the shared practices that these objects point to, whether that is... Whether we're seeing people move, whether you're, you're looking for also shared identity. Shared or identity. Or whether that's an indicator. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. that's even approachable. Yeah. The movement of people and animals is going to have to be done by our isotope and DNA co specialist colleagues. Um, we've for our material in, in the Kanemasi, we've begun preliminary analyses to reconstruct um, herding patterns, and um, we will see how far that takes us in, 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 that, in that regard. Um, in terms of the uh, identity, I think, I think that there are multiple, like we've been saying before, there are multiple forms of belonging and distancing and multiple processes and negotiations going on in uh, a zone like that. Um, that I think uh, the, the drinking cups, because they are non-elite and they are widely accessible as the masses of them around at every other every site at least in 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 the in the Diala area um, are um, a way of uh, creating community by people who are not um, necessarily agents of states or empires um, so I think that's a bottom-up process uh, particularly when it comes to the Western Zagros side of things um, the interesting thing about them is that it is really just these goblets and the faience buckets uh, and, 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 and shell rings in the burials that really are a, uh, a linking element. Otherwise, these sites are quite distinct in their cultural practices. Um, the mud brick architecture in, down in the lowlands, the um, highland sites tend to be constructed using um, stones, etc. So the, 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 if we want to um, link identity or we want to see identity created through practice, then these sites have very distinct cultural identities otherwise, I would say. Now, how people perceive themselves and, and may express that in, in language and in other ways is, is another question, of course. But in terms of the material evidence that we have from these sites, they are quite different, um, culturally quite different, and yet there is an element of interlinking in a way of maybe creating a shared community, if not necessarily an, an, a spoken identity or an, a, def, a defined identity. I don't know whether they would have seen themselves as, as a cohesive group or that just people who engage occasionally in the right moment at the right occasions in a shared practice using recognizable material culture that belongs in that realm of that practice. I um, don't know if that answers your question. Uh, so I was struck by your final remarks about where you were seemed to be saying that this wasn't just about influence, but about kind of deep cultural knowledge and communities. And I just wondered whether you found the notion of influence itself kind of a problematic concept, or whether there would be places where, based on the remains, you 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 would interpret that as influence rather than this kind of yeah. cultural knowledge. So the question is whether inf the word influence is a problematic term. The answer is yes. Um, and I, I use it more in the sense of um, 
how the narrative is generally constructed as the center, in this case Mesopotamia, obviously influencing by its own civilizational grandeur, influencing whatever, whatever is beyond, whatever is outside of, its, um, of what we perceive of it as a civilization, but also the Mesopotamian self-talk of itself as um, superior in some ways to the highland wild people. Um, so yes, it's absolutely, and, and it was, it, it was tongue-in-cheek, I suppose, more than a, a, a way for me to, to uh, convey my understanding of the situation. I think that um, what I was trying to say with it is, is that the combination of the faience buckets, the burials, uh, the drinking goblets, the shell rings, um, by keeping these assemblages together, I think that is indicative of, of knowledge of a practice. Um, and that these things belong together and, and work as a, as a ritual assemblage in the way that we see them in the, in the lowlands, um, that points to me to something beyond the um, picking and choosing of appropriation of local adoption of, of material practices, um, but requires a, 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 the knowledge and the familiarity that they go together, they do, some, they do something important together. What, what that is, we don't know, but. They, they are something, they, they are an assemblage. We unfortunately have already run out of time for questions, um, but I will say that lunch has been provided, so if anybody has any further questions, to so please come and ask Pinar and Claudia um, over lunch. But I would like to say uh, thank you again to Pinar and Claudia for their talks, and we will see you all back here at two o'clock. Thank you. I'm just gonna take this.